the homestead of Daniel Karuhanga remained under the spell of dark clouds that gathered overhead in a fit of rage hours before he was killed. Who wanted this affable man dead and what was the motive? Karanga was killed alongside five others at about 1 a.m. on 17th August 2013. At the crack of dawn, the orange glow of the sun gradually ascended over Kachumbiro village in Rushere, illuminating every blade of grass. However, it was not until morning when the family reported the killings to Rushere police station at 6.30 a.m. NTV pieced together evidence from the crime scene, interviews, and what was recorded in witness statements. Some of this evidence shows glaring contradictions that should have further been interrogated by police. So why did those who were not killed, including Karuhanga's second wife, Joyce Kabashaho, not make an alarm after the killers paid off in Karuhanga's vehicle? Were they perhaps too scared to speak? Why did the killers spare the life of, of Karanga's second wife and her niece, Bonita Choheire? Was it a rush to implicate Kawashaho in the murder? Why did police not investigate any theory in regard to Kawashaho? Kawashaho was previously married and her past record should also have been examined as she left her previous marriage acrimoniously and was fighting over property with her former husband. One of the key clues that required further interrogation was why did most of the victims not have defensive injuries? Could they have been in their sleep when the attack took place? Is it possible that the food they had in the night was laced with sedatives to give the killers a much easier task? And could they have been in their sleep when the attack took place? According to the evidence tendered in court and records of the cross-examination, it came to light that most of those killed were found lying on their beds. Was it strange that none of them stood up to fight the killers before they struck? In respect to one of the rooms, the police officer Noreen Akelo testified that there were two bodies on a bed and one was facing up with a wound on the throat. The Rizi Region Crimes Officer, Sulaiman Nabasa, also took photographs. Two bodies had multiple cuts at the neck and another body was cut at the neck cone. He also observed that the two other bodies were found in their beds. Karanga's body was specifically cut on the face and neck. This is instructive of Dr. Peter Kalubi's post-mortem report. Dr. Kalubi, it was also observed that all the victims had deep cuts at their neck and were attacked on their beds, apparently in their sleep, apart from Eldad Tumwine, who fought and was killed outside the house. Common sense will tell you that six men cannot be cut or slaughtered like chicken and that they don't defend themselves, that there are no defense injuries on them. This is extremely, this is absurd. This is totally abnormal. According to the witness statement of Kabashaho, the second wife of Karuhanga, the deceased was the first to be killed after he reportedly fought with the assailants. But her statement appears contradictory with that of another survivor. One of the survivors, whose identity we can't disclose for safety reasons, says that Eldad Tumwine was killed first. So why did police not further interrogate this piece of evidence? Among us, those police should have picked interest in is Bonita Chohere, the niece of Kabashaho, who was in one of the rooms when the attackers raided the home of Karuhanga. In her first statement to police, she revealed that after Karuhanga was killed, Kabashaho started making an alarm and calling her dad to Mwine for assistance and her dad was making an alarm from his room and the killer said El dad was to be killed. According to her statement, the occupants of the room next to me, where Muse Karanga slept, switched off the security light. All of a sudden, I heard the voice of Auntie Joyce Kawashaho shouting that don't kill my kid. I then heard a lot of struggles, and they heard the voice of my aunt lamenting that Muse has died. 
Johire revealed that the killers, under the spell of darkness, had stood on my door. I saw light outside, and the killer passed the muzzle of the gun through the door where I was sleeping, and later I remained outside. In her second statement to police, Johire said she had the attackers asking about whom the occupants might be in the room where she was sleeping. The way they are breathing, that is a place for children, replied one of the assailants, which prompted them not to access her room, Johire is quoted saying. This is a contradiction of what she had earlier on stated, that the killer had passed the muzzle of the gun through the door where she slept. According to Kabashaho, the killers locked the bolt of the house before they fled and they had to rely on a child of four years who was shoved through a narrow space in burglar proof to go outside and unlock the bolt. But is this theory plausible that a child of four could go through these iron bars and open the bolt of the door? According to some of the eyewitnesses who reached the crime scene in the morning, the mattresses where most of the victims were killed and were soaked in blood were later burnt. Was this meant to destroy a vital piece of forensic evidence? Johire was the first to report the incident to Rushere police station at 6.30 a.m. Efforts to speak to Kabashaho were futile as her known phone was switched off. She now lives in Gomba district. On learning about the death of their father, some of Karuhanga's children left Kampala for Chiruhura. But on their way, they were intercepted by police and detained. Okay, so even to be suspected of such a heinous crime, you have been law-abiding citizens without any criminal record. I had been a lawyer, practicing lawyer for about five years. So it was extremely sad, but the, problem, the, the, the situation was compounded by even, our, even the denial okay, of us to bury and breathe and, 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 and mourn for our, our father. We asked them to take a statement from that man who had, who had uh, borrowed my father's car the day before his murder. When they arrested him, they brought him to Kabuta Road and they were transferring us to Chireka. So we picked him on the way from Kabuta Road. You know where the Antonde and the Kabuta Road meet? Um, Mara Road and Kabuta Road. At that junction we met him. We traveled with him in the same car. The arresting officer had arrested him six months before that for a murder he had committed in the neighboring village, Nyakashara. Emotions in the family of the late Karuhanga ran like a fickle stream as his casket was lowered in the boils of the earth accompanied by a solemn dash. The then DPC Chiruhura district, Musinga told mourners that after arresting them, we started interrogation. Some of the suspects confessed they had been hired to kill the old man and gave the police details. Who were the financials and how it was carried out? The IGP, after securing the habeas corpus, invites our lawyers, let us sit down and talk. I am giving your people police bond Organize your, your sureties. Let them be ready. We are going to do what? To give them bond. Our relatives, our well-wishers, our friends, organize themselves. We are going to stand sureties. They are ready. Friday comes, there is nothing. We were supposed to be produced in cotton man. When the weekend comes, of course, there is nothing that can be done in the courts. Finally, what happens? Monday, we are produced in court and charged. Because they were trying to beat against the time for the habeas corpus that had been put. James Asimwe, who is amongst the three men who were convicted in 2015, had earlier on alleged in a charge and caution statement that Grace Karanga, the son of the deceased, had taken part in the killings. But this statement was not admissible 
as it was flawed and had been recorded after Simwe was coached to falsely implicate Karanga. Grace Karanga, who spent two years and three months in Luzira prison as a suspect, gave an account of his movements from 15th August to 17th August when his father was killed. Grace Karanga, who is a lawyer by profession, says they were not shocked by their arrest. He recalls they were remanded in Luzira on 22nd October 2013, barely after one of the most senior former police officers came to Luzira and picked one of the convicts, James Asimwe, from the Quadrango. But Asimwe's first charge and caution statement, which NTV has seen and was tendered in court as part of the evidence, does not implicate Grace Karanga or any of his siblings. Talk to, the, to this suspect who neither knew me nor had ever had any interaction with me, okay, with the intention of enticing him to implicate me. Okay? Fortunately, he had made a charge and caution statement before where he had actually confessed to, the, to his involvement in the crime. Okay? So he was made to record another additional statement, another charge and caution. Okay? Where he was made to mention other people in his charge and caution statement as having been parties to, to the group that committed those heinous crimes. Jolly Akandwa Naho, who is a sister of Grace Karuhanga and was detained and freed after seven months, was baffled about why police did not probe other theories. He had been arrested and released six months for a murder he had committed in the presence of many people. For a one man called Robert Somebody. So this one time, the arresting officer asked him, they were gracious to our Zaji, what is it this one time that you have been arrested for? When Akandwa Naho was released, she commenced a probe on her own to free her siblings and mother from the shackles of bondage. When I came out myself, I went and met the DPP, Mr. Chibita. I introduced myself. He welcomes me, he offers me where to sit. I tell him, I ask him, the reason I've come here is one. You have read our file, I am so sure. You have charged us. You have really held us tight. I want to understand, where do you see the case? Because you have been able to read through the file, you have understood it. Let me understand. I did not want to corrupt him because really it was not a case of corruption at all. Uh, you know how things were moving. I, Joda Kandwano, who has just come out of prison, would not start anywhere here to bribe anybody. There were a number of strange occurrences. The file goes missing, police file. When I go to the state attorney of uh, now, the Lady Justice, Lady Justice Angeline, who was supposed to pre preside over that session, pulled out of the case, citing reasons beyond her country. The police spokesperson, Fred Nanga, denied claims that some of its officers acted unprofessionally. He told NTV that the police dedicated its best team and funds to investigate the scene of crime until the case was dismissed on a technicality. And I quote, the office of the DPP carefully evaluated the evidence and the facts were sufficient to prosecute the case. Enanga, however, acknowledged that the judge found the evidence against Karanga's children and first wife Jovia Karanga uncorroborated. And I quote, you can't blame the police 100%. Police and the DPP all play an important role in criminal cases, and the case took three years to be tried. This presented challenges to many actors, including witnesses and the forensic evidence. However, the case was not dismissed on what Enanga claims was a technicality, but the absence of incriminating evidence. After impartial flees, the file later resurfaced as the session was rescheduled for April 2015 
Alice Nayebari, a sister of Grace Karuhanga, who had been in jail for two years and one month, was acquitted on a no case to answer at the commencement of the trial under Judge Lamek Mukasa in Imbara High Court. During the trial, a habitual criminal, Hussein Binoga, was brought to Mbara prisons so that he could be able to identify Grace Karuhanga. He was also coached to lie that he drove Grace Karuhanga to the crime scene and later took the deceased's car to the DRC where it was sold. As we were preparing to go to court, this gentleman approaches me, greets me, and indicated to me that he knew me more than I did. And indeed, I had never seen him. It was extremely surprising. But while at Rizira, I had heard of his name, okay? I had heard of his name and all the maneuvers the police were, were doing because they had a lot of pressure from the, 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 the chief executive to ensure that at least they nail some members of our family. Nineteenth day of August 2013, that very day, when he claims he was in Congo selling the car, he was in Reb Con, conning Mr. Bakunda and his other friends of 12 million. It is on a court record. And you are bringing Vinoga as a substantial witness to stand the test of time. And you are giving justice to the dead, to the alive, to everyone, to the nation and the world. Akandwa Naho had earlier on conducted a probe on Binoga. She discovered that he had been detained at Nyamesheker police station in Wusheni after accessing his file. On the day he purported to have driven Grace Karanga to the crime scene, according to his file, Binoga on that day was arrested for conning a Busheni based businessman, Adonia Bakunda. The prosecution adduced 33 state witnesses, and after evaluating the evidence, Judge Lamek Mukasa on December 2nd, 2015, delivered his judgment. Justice Mukasa found James Asimwe guilty of the offense of rape, murder, and aggravated robbery, while Matthew Mugoha and Amon Strabaje were found guilty of the offense of aggravated robbery and murder. The prosecution team's case collapsed against Grace Karhanga when one of the key police detectives in the case, Simon Mapera, gave a spectacular defense of Karuhanga's alibi. The prosecution side lodged an appeal four years later. The appeal was fixed and heard in December 2019. But you see, I met Grace at Chireka when he was in police custody. I had a discussion with him. He told me his movements from the 25th of August until his arrest. He told me how he had been to Masaka High Court before Justice Omoguri for, for hearing some case. So I went to, to, to Masaka before the judge. I interacted with the judge. I interacted with the clerk to the judge. I went to the hotel where he had slept, Hotel Zebra. I confirmed that court Grace had been in court. I confirmed that he had slept in, in Hotel Zebra. I confirmed that he left and went for the burial of his uncle in, in Kashari. I had an interaction with the people in Kashari where he had, he had gone for burial. We took photographs of the, of the grave. We had phone printouts which indicated that that same time he came back to Kampala. Okay? Unlike the kind of allegations that were being leveled against him that he had gone to the village. So I confirmed that his defense of alibi was true, correct and accurate. I looked at him, I could not believe for two and a half, for two and four months, two, and, two, two years and four months I had been in police, in, in, in detention, I could not hold back, I cried. You should have seen the forgeries. You should have seen people who had never seen us misidentify us. You should have seen people who call me Naebare Aris, my sister. You should have seen who, people who called, uh, who called other people my brother. Yet they thought they had been with him in the same house. 
Yet they confessed that they had seen him on the night of the murder. You should have seen. You should have seen the circus. I am so sure the judge was so patient to listen to 33 plus witnesses. Barbara Masinde, the land senior state attorney from the office of the director of public prosecutions, appeared for the appellant. Grace Karhanga, who opted to represent himself, objected to be represented by a lawyer on state brief. He argued that the DPP's office had shown no interest in prosecuting the present appeal an inordinate delay in dispensing justice. A quorum of three justices of the Court of Appeal including Elizabeth Musoke, Ezekiel Muhanguzi, Remy Kasule, sitting in Masaka, delivered their judgment. The justices opined that this was an ordinate delay in prosecuting the present appeal, which we find inexcusable. We take it that the DPP lost interest in the matter and was only awoken up after being served with a hearing notice. This is when they requested for a complete record of proceedings by a letter dated 20th September 2019, which was filed on the date of the hearing of this appeal on 24th September 2019. Court indicted the office of the DPP for its conduct this present case and argued that in the present case is an example of flagrant abuse of court process which court may stamp out. We are therefore constrained and hereby dismiss this appeal. But the spokesperson for the office of the DPP, Jacqueline Okui, defended the institution. She argued that there was evidence against the suspects. Okui said the appeal was dismissed by the Court of Appeal on a technical ground. The time that the court decided whether the accused person should be put on their defense the court decided to put all of them, apart from the last accused person, on their defense, implying that there was evidence that supported the indictment. If the court had found that there was no evidence to support the, the indictment, the court would have acquitted them at that point. Yes. Now, it's also interesting to note that after they had been acquitted by the High Court, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions went ahead to file a notice of appeal. Six years and three months after Karuhanga was killed, many theories remain abound about the bangled probe and cover-ups, the motive and the number of those involved in planning this murder. Emmanuel Mutaizibwa, NTV.